Oh, good morning, everybody. That's the right response. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm John Chubb, uh, the head of education sector, and I want to welcome all of you and thank you all for coming. Um, I know all of us have other things that we can do with our Friday mornings, and we're very grateful that you have decided to uh, join us. Uh, the program today, I think, uh, I think is fascinating. Uh, the topic is the topic is a blended learning, uh, and the focus is a incredibly interesting school that uh, Susan Hedden, our managing editor, uh, recently wrote about uh, in a piece for Education Sector uh, entitled uh, "The Right uh, The Right Mix." So that's uh, that's sort of an overview of uh, of where we're going. Uh, why we think this is pretty interesting. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Susan Head. Susan, thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. And a special thank you to uh, all of our panelists and especially <coughs> to Mickey, who uh, came from a very, lo very long distance and um, uh, I think was a little disappointed in our weather and, <laughs> and the failure of uh, our cherry blossom.
instructors, so it might start uh, down with um, you, um, Bill, or, or John, either one of you can chime in on um, the definition of blended learning. I think, as John mentioned, there's a lot of misconception about what blended learning really is. It's not just uh, putting students in a computer lab for a few hours a day. It's something uh, quite different. So why don't we start by talking about what blended learning is, and as important, what it is not. So. Great, thanks. <clears throat> I have to tweet that preeminence, so thank you. <laughs> um, thank you to education sector for holding this event. It's just so important that um, you know, this, this conversation, and particularly around blended learning, the promises, some of the struggles and, and challenges, you know, it's not just sort of uh, held with the sort of technology groups and digital learning groups, but sort of the broader education community to kind of look at the intersection with other policies and, and reforms and, and to raise some questions. It's hard when you're sort of in your own niche to kind of take a step back and sort of think more broadly about it. Uh, blended learning, and, and I'll sort of just give what has become sort of more of the standard definition that uh, InnoCite has sort of put out there and a lot of folks have adopted, but it's where uh, it's a formal program of instruction where part of the instruction uh, happens online or with a computer-based software and content where the student has some control over uh, part of that instruction with their, their pacing of it, the path, um, the place, uh, and sort of the modality of it a, a little bit as well. And then part of the instruction happens in a brick and mortar environment as well. So it could be a school, it could be a learning center, uh, it could be a learning lab. But it's, it's trying to combine the best of online learning and the online delivery of content, services, resources, and interventions with the best of, of instruction. I, I think that second question though is probably more important almost than that. It, it's a little bit more easy to, to define what blended learning is not. Uh, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there right now that uh, it, we saw this just working with grantees recently of, of folks that thought blended learning is, is really sort of taking the same instructional model that you have in, in your current class, in your current school, and just you know, replacing it with a layering on top of it, I should say, a little bit more devices, you know, some iPads, some tablets, and then a lot of online software and services. Uh, and I think that it's probably a tech, what, what we're sort of settling on is like a technology rich environment, uh, but it's not really blended. It's not really sort of changing fundamentally the instructional design, the class design, uh, and the way that the school is sort of modeled. I, I think there's, there's something about changing uh, the, the, the design of those systems uh, and the, the way time is used and the way schools organize that is present in these blended learning uh, classrooms and schools that you can go visit that you just don't see in a sort of a technology rich environment. So I, I think there's a lot of challenges with, with these definitions too because these models are sort of rapidly expanding uh, and there's lots of experimentation happening and we're seeing all sorts of different you know, models. InnoCite has sort of you know, develop kind of a, a methodology of thinking about d different types of classifications. But, you know, I think as we see these models evolve, even those classifications are going to have to evolve over time as well. Yeah, and, and I just add one thing that increasingly um, we've been thinking about this less in terms of which technologies use, whether it's blended or devices or anything, and more in terms of personalization. So focusing less on the means and more on the goals. And, um, and that, I think, is a really important distinction. It helps uh, make the distinction between some of what John's talking about and some of kind of technology for technology's sake versus really focusing on the instructional elements. Um, and I, I can't wait to hear Mickey talk more about that at her school. That's a great point, though. Well, I want to give an example of how personalization really is the most important part of the model. Last year at this time, I had opened with 9th, 10th, and 11th graders. Only 16 of my 11th graders this time last year had enough A through G credits to receive an Alliance diploma and or apply to a UC school. In December, 65 of those students now have A through G, and we're just waiting on those last eight. So personalization is part of the foundation along with the mastery learning. John, back to you on a question of Yeah, so this is, a, I think again it goes, uh, there's, there's a couple challenges with evaluating uh, these models. First is, uh, there's been a lot of technologies, you can go back two, three decades where there was talk of technology personalizing education and 
you know, it just a, a lot of sort of failed promises that didn't really live up to the evaluations at the time. And I think we're, we're starting to enter into a new environment where uh, the promises are actually, you're seeing the fulfillment of that. And I think it's because of um, the newer sort of richer technologies that are taking what you just heard about the diagnostic sort of assessments, uh, formative assessments in sort of real time and doing uh, a little bit more of a deliberate sort of way of personalizing what content gets to the students, what students should be doing with their time, recommendations like that, but it's changing sort of a model. Uh, the challenges with e evaluation and research is, you know, we've, we've not, some of these new models have only been around for a couple of years. Uh, and it's difficult, do you, are you evaluating the technology, which is what some of the early studies did, uh, and when you evaluate technology, it's a little bit like evaluating uh, antibiotics, meaning if you get an antibiotic and don't take it every single day the way the doctor prescribes it, if you take all 10 pills in the first day, the antibiotic's not going to necessarily work. It doesn't mean the antibiotic wasn't effective. It means that the way it was used, the implementation uh, of that antibiotic wasn't you know, sort of appropriate and therefore it skewed the results. We were seeing this uh, very early on when I was at the U.S. Department of Ed. We commissioned a couple studies and it was very difficult to sort of track that fidelity of implementation. Was the technology being used in the way that it was attended? You could take a really great, powerful learning platform, but again, if the teacher uses it as a, a babysitting tool or just doesn't use it at all, obviously it's not going to have the effect that, um, that it was intended. Uh, the Department of Ed did a sort of a meta data study on um, what sort of, you know, the latest research tells us about blended learning. What, what they found, a lot of people sort of jumped on the one sentence in this like very lengthy report, which is it showed very promising results and even more effective than online education. There were, but there were a lot of caveats to that. They, they found very little rigorous studies uh, that used sort of a quasi-experimental or experimental design. And most of the studies they found that showed promise were more in sort of post-secondary and job training environment. So it doesn't mean that that's bad. It just means that we probably need to do a little bit more evaluation and research in, um, in, in the, these K-12 models. Uh, this, the last point just to make is that, you know, it's, it's difficult. I, I, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing, but you know, often we want to sort of jump in and measure the technology. So the blended learning platform, is that what was effective? And I, again, I keep coming back to it's a model that is using uh, that technology with a lot of different uh, changes in time and classroom structure, the use of teachers. The, the combination of all those factors is probably what is delivering the improved student outcomes. If you ever visit one of these models, the, uh, the schools that are up here are a rocket ship, it's very difficult to sort of say what's the technology sort of contribution to these you know, teachers that are sort of getting more one-on-one -on -one time with some students, there's specific types of content that are getting served up. And I, I don't think we should shy away from that. I think there's sort of a, a chance to evaluate the models as themselves and then to try to separately sort of piece out what's the technology's contribution to those types of uh, improved student outcomes. It's tricky though, and it's, it's expensive. We probably need more sort of federal research dollars to kind of help look at the evaluation of this. Um, because again, if you're sort of one of these you know, bootstrap companies, you're not gonna put up the couple hundred thousand to do an evaluation. And, and schools really need sort of extra resources to help you know, do a really rigorous quality, long-term uh, quasi-experimental study there. But that, so I, I think there's some challenges, but lots of sort of promise. And I think you're sort of looking at a lot of these new models that are showing lots of promises in ter terms of improved student outcomes as measured by state assessments, graduation rates, uh, and attendance, uh, and a whole bunch of other different sort of student outcomes. Thanks, John. Does the successful blended learning uh, assume, are we assuming a competency model here? Uh, and if so, what are the challenges in Sure, so this is where it gets even trickier. So I, I think um, we could almost draw a Venn diagram. A number of, of blended learning models to use competency, and I think yours does, and, and you may also, um, but not all of them have to, and not all of them do. So it's, it's a little bit of a Venn diagram. Um, and the competency-based piece is, is really fascinating because it pushes, it's gonna really push, and I think as this, increasingly we're gonna see more and more, and there's more interest in states, um, it's going to push sort of our definition of um, what does quality look like, what does good student performance look like. I think last count, and John knows better than I do, something like 38 states have seat time waivers and things. So I, I think it's actually less of the waiver issue for seat time. While that can be an issue, we've got all of these exceptions out there. 
I think the bigger issue is as, as we see more and more um, schools trying to think about, um, and you touched on this in your piece, Susan, sort of competency, not just the, hey, did the student get a D and they can move on, but did they really learn it? And do they have the scaffolding to, to learn the next thing? Um, it's, it's gonna, I think it's gonna be less about waivers and things and more about, well, how do we actually define performance? How do we actually think about student progression? How do we actually think about what a school's supposed to do and how, how we judge that? I don't think we have that figured out yet. And I would say that's the, if you're looking over the horizon to some of the challenges over the next two, three, four, or five years, that's gonna be a key, a key policy question. First thing, as the instructional leader, I had to make sure that no one, a student, a parent, or a teacher, felt that they were addressing and responsible for two hours for 48 kids. So how do you do that? We well, have to build a family, and you have to make sure that you are talking about 16 to 1. So when you come to visit the school, we've been very successful. The only time a teacher truly feels that there's 48 kids in that class is if the assessments from the online software isn't talking to their grade book. Because now they're manually transferring grades. Now they feel as if they're responsible for 48 to 1. But when I coach teachers and when teachers are going through professional development, we really talk about this is what you need to do in direct. And in direct, you only have 16 students. When you plan an effective collaborative, the teacher, once, plan, once they plan the collaborative, they're not teaching the collaborative. They're still with 16 to 1. Once they make the decision about what's going on in their online or their independent, again, the teacher's not involved in that. And what we have is we have expectations for each of those stations. We have student outcomes. Students write action plans. They're solely responsible for tracking their own data and their own success. I'm not going to lie to you, the first month, of a teacher's life is very steep. The learning curve is very steep. And I opened a school in Watts three years ago, and when I left that school to open this school, I said to my staff, what should I say in that interview? Be honest. Tell teachers that that first month is gonna be the toughest month, whether they've taught before or whether they're a brand new teacher, and then outline all the supports. We have a blended learning coordinator that is there instantly if there's something wrong with the software. I have an IT person who's there instantly if something's wrong with the hardware. And then I have myself and um, mentor teachers to go in and help them with the model. 
So once teachers know what their support systems are, they're really pretty comfortable. But then imagine if you're teaching for me at my school and 20 other schools within the Alliance, they have a ratio of 25 to 1. So we had to address that as, um, as a larger organization. But the reality is in California now, in every classroom, there's going to be 35 kids minimum. The kids say that the learning curve was, was pretty steep for them as well. So uh, what do you do to flatten that out a bit? Well, when we opened Tenenbaum Tech, it was originally known as ATEMS. We didn't have, we got the keys from LAUSD Friday at 5 and we opened Monday. Um, yeah, so I was unloading the computers, but you know, welcome to LAUSD. So we didn't have a chance to do a summer bridge program. And what we do now is we bring in the teachers and the students for about 20 days in the summer and we, we, we blast them. That's what it's called, blended learning, alliance school transformation is really what our model is called. And so for 20 days, they're learning all the things that were a steep curve when we first started. How well prepared are teachers to instruct in this, in this new manner? And anybody can address that. Well, I'll start. Um, you have to prepare teachers. They can't just bring a lesson plan that they used last year in history and then make it fit into our digital agendas. It's not going to work. So really, we have a template. We start planning early. We start with unit plans. We start with the, the, the end in mind. What does mastery look like for this power standard? And then we backtrack that. Teachers get a lot of support when it comes to planning, continuing throughout the year. Um, what we're trying to do now, as more of our Alliance schools want to convert, is we're trying to archive some of the exemplar lessons. And we, we open our door to anyone that wants to come in. So we do a lot of co-planning within the grade levels as well as within the content. What about teacher prep programs? Uh, would anyone like to speak to um, how, how equipped they are in their um, current? <laughs> so I, I would just say probably woefully equipped to help with this sort of model. I think. You know, if anything, you've, the teacher prep programs are sort of lagging just generally, but if they are, you know, helping to train teachers uh, around technology, it's usually sort of about how to do a purely online course, or it's about sort of more, again, that technology-rich environment, right, where kids may all have laptops or a computer lab, and how do you as a teacher put together a lesson with some internet tools and some internet content, but the, the type of model that you're seeing in, in in Mickey's school and just as these blended models, it's a completely sort of different way of, uh, of you know, managing the classroom, using the tools, not getting overwhelmed. Um, you know, it, 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 the teachers I talk to in these environments talk about it as sort of the reason they got into teaching. The, the numbers show that it's 48 students to one teacher, but they're feeling like it's more 101 instruction in a way that gives them a, a more connection with the students than they get. And even, you know, sort of in these artificial numbers we could create, whether it's, you know, like 18 students per teacher, 25 or, or not, there's more sort of interaction that's happening there. But it, it seems right for, you know, there, there's a lot of ex exploration now with residency programs with teacher prep, and this seems like a perfect, you know, opportunity for that. There's, there's only so much you can learn in a, in a classroom at a, at a, you know, prep school without sort of going in and experiencing this environment. And so, you know, maybe we'll start seeing you know, some of these networks uh, beginning to, to become resident programs for teacher prep, too. Yeah. No, I, no, I just wanted to ask Aaron and Mickey about that. Um, the sense that we get is it's not only not experience in the particular environment, which a residency or more clinical experience would help with, but also some of the underlying components that may be heightened, uh, such as you know, formative assessment, um, better making meaning of instructional data, some of, some of the classroom management challenges. I'm wondering if there's sort of, um, uh, you could think of like remaking teacher prep to really focus on very specific sort of blended learning, or you could think of kind of underlying capabilities that, that, that teachers in all settings could use but might be particularly heightened in those settings. I'd be interested in your thoughts on what those might be. Model is as if telling them that there's another world that exists. I mean, it, 
and, and very educated educators are, what is this? I want to know more. Um, so I, there's so much potential there. And there's so much potential specifically, in my opinion, for students with special needs. I think that's the background I come from is engage, 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 um, modalities. I mean, and, and it's, a, it's an educator's dream. It's a special educator's dream. Um, so I think that's an excellent point, and that's something that you know, I think there is a lot of focus now in the teacher prep programs on formative assessment, on using data effectively. I don't think we do the best job of telling them what that means and allowing them to actually um, experience that and partake in that, that they sort of more receive it than participate in it. Um, but, but there's so much potential there, and I, I think just models such as these are going to, to help get us there, but it's a slow process, as you mentioned. I mean, it's, we're just starting to, to get a little bit better known. I mean, and I think once we have the data to support that it, it works, and it works for many students, it won't work for all students, just like the traditional model does work for some students, I mean, to give it some credit. Uh, but for our student populations, we, we find that this works a lot better <coughs> in our experience. And just coming from brick and mortar, which we both did, we were talking about, you're a first year teacher again. You can forget everything you learned in your teacher prep program. You can forget everything you thought you were good at in the brick and mortar because this is a new job. It's a completely different um, job because you, you have to let some of that go to the student. And um, I think that's another piece that along with what you're saying with underlying components, the teachers have to sort of be comfortable giving some of that uh, directive to the student and saying, I trust you to go and to, <laughs> to direct your own learning and to follow that. Um, but then you also have to have the comp confidence in the technology too, we were talking about our different models. So I, I think, there are a lot of pieces that it's sort of that same general response of what's going to follow the others. Is the research going to follow the you know the establishment of these schools, or is it going to be vice versa? So it's uh, it's a challenge, but I, I think I mean just just coming from a research university and graduating from there, doing a master's there, I, I think it, had they been more aware of these models, goodness, they would have latched onto it. So where can we do this, or where can we put this into place? And we we're talking about the difficulty of securing grants in that way too. Another the teachers feel threatened by this. And, and I, another question is, uh, the, the beauty of blended learning is that it really frees up teachers to do what they do best. Um, and t taking over some of the chores, like um, you know, correcting math problems or grammar, mechanics, uh, and so forth. Um, but you know, you could also argue that it could serve as a sort of a you know a sorting device. You know. If, if, if the, the technology is going to do the easy stuff, then you know the teachers really do need to step up and concentrate on the hard stuff. So that whole notion of threats. Well, I am um, going back to the teacher prep. We are, as an alliance, looking to align ourselves with the university so we can create a mastery blended learning sort of teacher prep program, because the teachers. Um, the teachers are living action research every day. And if teaching truly still is an art, which I believe, then things need to change in real time. So that means you, you can't be married to a, a textbook or a curriculum or a pacing guide. You really need to respond to the data and respond to the needs of the students that are in front of you. And I think that's one thing, the three years I've been involved um, with Blended Learning and the Alliance is that teacher prep programs, should you should be teaching them how to do action research. What do you do when you actually find a piece of data? How do you react to that? And I got interested in this a long time ago when I wrote my dissertation, and it was on formative data. And I co-authored it with someone who interviewed principals. And then I interviewed English and history teachers. And the disconnect between those two groups in the same school took my breath away. The teachers just wanted to be told, how do I reteach the standard? I get that they didn't get it, but I have no other tricks. The principal's like, well, look at these charts and graphs. There was, <laughs> and so with the blended learning, I realized that if you teach people how to do action research, then you are going to have highly effective learning and teaching. And that's what I would love to see the, the teacher prep programs go to. If you could speak a little bit more to um, ways that you've shifted um, instruction or sh shifted, you know, um, some of the specifics of, of your model, when because so much of this is, is somewhat experimental. So you try it, you know, it doesn't really work. Uh, let's be honest about a, a few of the things that didn't work and um, how, how you 
Well, we call them signature practices. So if a teacher is particularly frustrated with what's going on in collaborative, um, this teacher developed the, the collaborative protocols, very similar to if you're in a science lab, everyone has a different job, there's different accountabilities, and then they developed an exit slip. And these are just, these are the student collaborative sessions where they right. get together the student collaborative block to teach each other. Mm -hmm. And one of my questions was, is, you know, these might only be as, as, as good as, you know, the students themselves right. make them. So, so, that, so what we did when we, we try to develop a signature practice is we do it with action research, with fidelity. We try to tweak it and change it. And the collaborative was our, our biggest challenge because in reality there are eight rival gangs that feed into my school. And so four gang members could be sitting across from one another. So you have to have your eyes wide open to that. And so we um, started a process called academic discourse because the very first collaborative um, signature practice that we had didn't work because it's really about academic discourse and what does that look like. So we had to teach academic discourse indirect with fidelity so now it happens in collaborative. All the other signature practices were developed by teachers. Um, how do you get 48 high schoolers to stand up, rotate to a different desk without wasting valuable instructional time? Well, I mean, it's a color-coded system. There's numbers on the desk. So if you're number one in collaborative, then when you move to independent, you're number one. So our transitions <coughs> came down to almost about 30 seconds now. And that was just because the teacher's like, oh no, this is not the way it's gonna happen. <laughs> and so then they develop a signature practice and we, we all adapt and, and adopt it. Do you group students by uh, ability level uh, based on regular assessments? It depends on the teacher and the comfort level of the teacher. Um, my highly effective teachers do group them by ability level. And if you've ever been a teacher before, that means that your second language students and your special ed students could all be grouped in one group. And that takes a lot of energy if you don't have helpers with that. So um, math teachers will group by ability and kids, and they'll regroup by ability based on standards. So if you prove mastery, um, high mastery of a standard on a pretest, then typically you're going to start an independent. If you prove low mastery on a pretest, you, they, they'll group you in direct so they can have more time with you, more focused time before you move off to work with other students or to work in independent. My humanities teachers, they like to have mixed ability groups because of the reading and the writing levels. Okay. And, and how flexible, if at all, are those 40-40? Um, extremely flexible. The kids will notice that there are some days, particularly on different standards, where they're in direct a lot longer, and so there might only be two rotations in that two hour period, particularly if you're starting a brand new unit. Teachers know that they have the flexibility. Sometimes my English teachers just want to do a full class read, and so they do a full class read. Erin, um, you were talking earlier about um,
experienced educators coming to a totally new setting and feeling like first year teachers and having to you know, wrap our head around this new model and do it in a way that we weren't prepared in our education to do so. Um, really, you know, you have to be good at multitasking, but also with students who are presenting some serious challenges and who are also um, nervous about the change in setting too, and they're also getting used to it. So uh, we have to really iterate that we're learning together, and um, but it's, it, it presents more of a challenge, and as I mentioned, you know, it, it presents a challenge to our performance data as well, because you know now we're also faced with this daunting task of students who are coming to us. They haven't been reached in the public schools. They're, they're now in a new setting. They're with someone who is not an educator themselves, usually. Um, and so we're having to teach them how to educate the child, too, which is another addition. So it's very, very much, as you were saying, you know, you have to establish that family relationship, in my case, with the family and with the student. Um, but it, if you know you're a teacher, you can, you can have all the data, data you need. But if you can't establish that rapport, if you can't establish that environment, you, you're going to lose them right off. So we've got to. We've got to establish that first, and then the technology comes in. <laughs> Let's talk about data for a minute. Um, what what are what are you seeing uh, that's that, that indicates you're you're being successful, and what are you seeing that might indicate um, areas where you've got some work to do? In both cases, with Mickey and, and Aaron. So with our um, with our blended school again, a little bit different um, in in Washington D.C. It's community academy and public charter school online. We're actually a campus of community academy and public charter school. Um, we are seeing that our students are mostly making at least one year's worth of gains, so in the 70 percent, uh, with uh, both in regards to reading and math, are making at least one year's gain. Um, anywhere from 14 to 25 percent are also making multi years of gain, and we have you know between five and nine percent that that we're not seeing that gain. And what that could mean, just to translate to that a little bit, is that we might have had a student who came to us. Uh, proficient or right on the cusp of proficient with their state testing and then fell into the basic category. So that fidelity piece is a big one because we, as, as teachers, you know, we take a very good look at the data. We have so much available to us with the use of the online curriculum, which is a huge advantage. And we can often say, yes, that's the family that we knew was not, you know, doing lessons they need to do every day. And we were trying to engage them. They weren't engaged in coming so of course there's always more to it, and teachers tend to be very defensive of data, <laughs> as you might have experienced. But um, but that's because we're, we're so familiar with the students in their situation. So I'd say for the vast majority that are choosing it, that are implementing it with fidelity, it's working. But I will say it's also not for everyone. Our model is very different from Mickey's, but it's um, you have to have a dedicated individual there, and uh, they have to be really accountable, and we have to help them to do that. So. And what I've noticed um, as far as recruitment, because we are a public charter, which means we have 150 available seats in every grade level. And once, if there's 200 that want 150 ninth grade seats, then we go to lottery. But we, um, we haven't been that fortunate. We're only a second year school. So the types of students that, that are attracted to us are the extremes. We have the really high achievers. And again, this speaks to the personalization of the model who want to move through a couple AP courses online, who, who want to graduate early, get early acceptance into the university. And then I have almost 40 kids out of camp, um, out of the juvenile camps, because again, it's personalization. The most challenging group to keep in this model, year one, were the high achievers. And the reason it was difficult was because they have never faced failure before. They've always been the best. What do you mean you're not going to show me how to do this Prezi? I go, did somebody show you how to play a video game? No, we're, we're not going to have a formal lesson on how to build a Prezi. You just saw your classmate build one, ask her how to build one. And that was a very different role for these high achieving students. I had probably a dozen of them in my office. I want to go back to traditional. Why? Teacher tells you what you need to know and you tell it right back. I said, well, then you're absolutely not going back. So anyone, <laughs> so anyone who starts this model, you need to know that you have to nurture those, those high achievers because they, they've always felt they've been at top of the top of the pile and, and mastery was never a question for them. The other thing that we've noticed with this model is that I'm about 65% males. And I'm on a campus with four other schools, and I thought maybe it was because I wear uniforms and girls didn't want to wear uniforms. But when you query the, the, the boys, again, it's about the personalization. Because I think it's up until eighth grade, 
girls really shine in elementary school and middle school, and it kind of shifts a little bit. And I think this is an opportunity for the boys to really feel that, that they are accomplishing what they need to accomplish. As far as data, we only have baseline data on Tenenbaum from last year, but I did do the NWEA on all my students, and 65% of them were performing at sixth grade or below um, reading and, and math. Hundred. On entry. On entry. On entry. <laughs> on entry. Thank you. <laughs> then a hundred percent of them, when I tested them, pre-tested them for the Casey, which is the California exit exam, a hundred percent of them pre-entry were slated not to pass, and seventy-one percent of them passed in just six months. So I really feel, and, and if you come to visit the school, there, there's something engaging about the atmosphere. You just, even if you can't measure it, you go in there and you can feel that there's success. We just finished sitting the 10th graders for the KC. I had all 150 in the, the multi-purpose room so we could feel very college-like when we were taking it. And I was proctoring it. And they were so disappointed after two days of testing, they said, Dr. Tubbs, when are we gonna get our results? Because remember, they're used to pushing <laughs> enter and getting their results. And I said, May. And they said, can you start running the state of California? <laughs> <laughs> Mickey, you distribute uh, laptops to each of your students, uh, which is uh, not was, something everybody It was very knows. controversial. It's a great idea. So tell yeah. us why you thought it was a great idea. Do you still think it's a great idea? I do. I, I think it's a fabulous idea. And, and I can give you some concrete examples. It was very controversial. Um, my VP of schools didn't want me to do it. The CEO, the donor who donated the laptops didn't want to do it. But I knew it was important to trust. I knew it was important to trust an inner city kid with a $1,000 Mac laptop. And how do I know that's true? There were a couple times that, um, you know, as an instructional leader, you make mistakes. They have to have their shirts tucked in. They're coming up the stairs. And if you don't have your shirt tucked in, I'm like, give me your computer. You need to tuck your shirt in. Well, the kid behind saw you give me your computer and they're like, miss, how long are you gonna keep it? How's he gonna do his work? Then I realized it became an, an artifact. Then when we had state testing, I said, you know what, we're not gonna mess with computers because I, I have to collect cell phones and all that. We put the desk back in a traditional model because that's what you have to do when you state test and we took the computers away. I don't have discipline problems at my school. That first afternoon, I had six kids in my office for discipline problems. That next day, the kids came to me and said, look, if you put us back in traditional, we're gonna act like we're in traditional. We need to have our computers and we need to be back in our rotations, even when we're taking our test. So I just really believe that you can set a really positive culture by trusting kids with a $1,000 laptop. So I, I saw the data on how many had broken uh, over the course of the year. It was something like six out of 450. And I think you're doing better than my colleagues. <laughs> so so I, 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 it, it seems to be working. <laughs> yeah, and that's their laptop for four years. Mickey, some of these kids, I mean, most of them you know, maybe going on to colleges that they're, are not um, going to be structured in, in, in this way. Uh, I was really concerned by that because um, my kids are very vocal. They advocate for themselves and that is part of our culture. So we have dual, um, dual classes, dual enrollment classes. So a college professor does come in and teach an art history. And she turns the light out and for two hours she's showing slides. And my kids are just sitting there and I was worried about are they gonna pass it? Are they gonna be able to take the test? Are they gonna be able to handle it? And so when I sat down with them, they said, look, we already know how to collaborate. We already formed our study groups. We each share taking notes. What you taught us is going to get us through traditional. So we got to talk about software, which everyone says uh, is uh, lousy in, in a lot of cases. Um, and um, so you could say, you know, we could argue that if the, the instruction is, is, is so fundamentally based on
Well, three years ago when I opened the school in Watts, um, I was looking for a software company that would grow with me. Because when I previewed software, it was very apparent to me that the people creating the software had never seen it used by a student and never had a conversation with a teacher around the product itself. So I looked for two companies that were prescriptive and diagnostic that would grow with me and get into the classrooms and make changes as they saw they were needed. So for um, diagnostic and prescriptive in math, I, I chose Revolution Prep. Their product suite now is very different than it was three years ago because they are always listening to what the students are saying, what the teachers are saying. Then the second software that was prescriptive and diagnostic was Achieve 3000. It increases reading Lexile levels, vocabulary, and writing skills. And when I opened this school with no textbooks, because the state of California says you have to have some sort of textbook, we selected um, a software company that was a C plus called Compass Learning. Compass Learning is not, if there's a representative out there, I apologize, but you can talk to me after because I've been wanting to talk to you. They won't come and watch how the software is used. They're not interested in any sort of um, revamping of their product, but it's our compliance software. So the way I, I say it to the teachers and the kids and the families, it's kind of like even when I was a teacher with a textbook, the state of Texas said, okay, you have to have this textbook, but I never just use that book. You always brought in supplemental material. And so that's what teachers do. They, they find what's free out there, like Edmodo, and they bring in supplemental materials. But the software is a challenge. So I, I come from a very different experience. So um, my two schools are, are powered by K-12 Bank, and um, you know, so they have proprietary <laughs> everything. Um, there, there are some uh, materials that we, we purchase, but for the most part, um, we have a very direct, we are, with the same company, so we have a direct relationship. So um, just as recently as four weeks ago, I was at headquarters and I had the directors of all the different <laughs> um, curriculum area saying, what, what's going on, what's right, what's wrong, what's, it, we, we want to know. And every single issue that my staff of teachers raised were already being addressed because they, had, they have their finger on the pulse of what's going on. So that's one piece that's very fortunate coming from a company that, that sort of started in that way and then they are constantly conducting research on their own product and getting that feedback directly from the students and from the, you know, the teachers and those who are actually where the rubber meets the road. So um, we're very fortunate in that sense. And um, you know, that being said, we do have some, some pieces that we, uh, that we take from, from outside companies. We, we use Blackboard for our virtual classroom and you know, there, are, there are issues with that that aren't as, we're so spoiled with the immediate response from K-12. You know, there's, we found an error here, we, we need this, you know, lesson reworked or parents are saying there's something, it, it's immediate and it can be fixed in such a way that, you know, that textbook that has that line that you say, don't read that line, <laughs> just ignore that paragraph, guys, I want you to skip that, uh, because you knew that there was something that was wrong and, and you couldn't fix it immediately and you weren't gonna get new textbooks for five years in the brick and mortar. This is very different. Those are constantly being reworked and to fit and I know the history team was talking about, how, oh, well, we've already gotten up to you know, last year as far as history and they're already adding those things to the new materials that are being shipped out to families. So it's a, it's a huge advantage in my case, but, but you do also have the user piece, and that you can't control. So you need to make sure that they are um, they're using it with fidelity, that they understand that there are going to be challenges and that there's a, a system to deal with that. So, so we, uh, so Mickey, I'm interested in, in the perspective from your school. It sounds like Aaron, you've kind of dealt with it in a different way, sort of a single package. And then John, because I know you worked with a number of folks who are leading schools or collections of schools. Um, we did, we were really interested in this issue of, of uh, the tools that are available for teachers and how easy this is or how difficult it is. Um, your little vignette about the transition, I think, is a great example. If that takes five minutes, that's, that's, that's crushing. So how do these things get easier and they're not just really hard? In particular, given that the, it, it's, it's just teaching is difficult and your model of the steep learning curve. So, um, I think almost a thousand teachers, we did focus groups and research, and one of the biggest problems was being able to put these various things together. So how do all of these tools talk to one another, and how do I as a teacher get a complete picture of what a student's doing? Do I have to like go get a password to like 
figure out the left style level here and get something over here, and then I've got to make sense of it, and that's going to take an hour. So I, I'm interested in whether you've seen this problem, and John, you too, also. Um, we, we kept all the passwords in the first school on Google Docs, and it was pretty much a nightmare. So when I opened the comprehensive high school, all grade levels, all content with this model, we hired a company to build out the dashboard to have all of the um, functionality, the interoperability of the softwares to talk to one another. So when a student logs on, their dashboard comes up and they can see their mastery levels. Teachers can and administrators can go in and also we have a dashboard. So let's say on standard 25 in, in Algebra 1, I can cursor on all of my Algebra 1 kids and it'll tell me groups of proficients and far below basics so that I can group those for Saturday academies. So it's, it's pretty efficient. The only issue now is when Common Core rolls out, what's that going to look like? What is it that we actually need to measure to be successful? I would just say that I... And I want to leave some time to talk about policy. Talk about policy too. I, I think we've noticed this with a lot of implementations that there, there's, what Bill was just talking about is the integration of all that software that I was talking to a blended learning uh, provider the other day that said it was taking just 20 minutes to get, uh, before they could do the demo of their product, just to get through the passwords of logging into the computer, logging onto the internet, logging through uh, the f internet filtering software. I mean, there was just, and that was just to get to the instructional sort of content. And so, you know, it, it, when you start piecing together sort of platforms and data systems and analytics and then content, you know, very quickly, it, it just, it, it disrupts the experience. It creates like a not user-friendly experience for the teachers and the students. And, you know, it's probably one of the biggest challenges out there. And, and, and it's, a, it's a challenge not just from a development standpoint, but from as you know, schools and models start procuring this, how do you sort of drive that sort of integration? Not, and not just with a single sign-on with passwords, but the data sort of flowing in between. You know, the Gates Foundation has launched <clears throat> a nonprofit called In Bloom that's trying to sort of get at some of that. Uh, by sort of creating sort of the back-end plumbing of, of the data systems and some of the administrative infrastructure and kind of allow these systems to start working more seamlessly together. But it's probably one of the, the biggest technical barriers that we're sort of facing right now. Uh, and it's not just technical, it is that user experience. I mean, imagine every time, you know, we're all sort of used to logging on a laptop and you log in once, but imagine every single time you fired up Microsoft Office or Microsoft Excel or, you know, your Firefox browser that you had to type in a password and it's a different password, different username construction, you know, you throw your hands up in a fit pretty fast too. So it's, I think it's, it's a critical thing to sort of make this model work in the future. Makes you sort of want the textbooks, but that's the thing with California um, rule that you, you've got in the textbook. Um, let's talk about policies, state policies, district policies can of course, you know, help blended learning along or RMP uh, efforts. So uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, budgets, class size, uh, whatever, bandwidth, um, let's talk about um, some of the ways that, 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 that policies both Yeah, I'm just happy to, so I mean, we at Digital Learn Now, and myself in particular, are just really passionate about this because we think, you know, policy, state policy in particular matters here, and it, it matters in a whole variety of fashions that can help accelerate these models, or it can throw up barriers left and right, sometimes intentionally, uh, in terms, of, but sometimes unintentional. Uh, and you have, and again, it's obscure, a lot of times we talk about sort of barriers around like sort of class size or seat time. and. You know, th those are policies that are sort of quickly sort of getting addressed by a lot of you know state policymakers. But then there's all these sort of other obscure ones, like the California <coughs> one that we just heard about, where again you have to have a textbook, and uh, and often if that textbook definition isn't flexible enough, then you know I mean they're almost lucky in a way that they can even purchase something like that that's still sort of digital. There's still some states that say it has to be a physical textbook, and it's just sort of locking in sort of an old sort of incumbent entrenched sort of system in some ways. So. Yeah, you know, we think there's a lot of room to work with policymakers to help sort of educate them on these new models. Uh, and you know, we're, I'm increasingly becoming a fan of. Uh, you saw Kentucky do this uh, in this past legislative session. Pennsylvania and Ohio have this, but these sort of innovation waivers that, as models, whether it's a charter school or an online school or a traditional school, 
sort of as they're trying to do something, if they encounter a regulation that gets in the way, that they can apply to the state to get that waived. And that could be seat time, it could be class time, but it could be sort of these other things too, the textbook, how the money can be used for textbooks, if they need textbooks. It could be issues around, uh, there was one state that, uh, that is, their online schools were going sort of online, they had to do fire drills every month? Well, how do you do a fire drill when your students are doing <laughs> And again, you know, it, it's, a great, it's a great example where like the regulation wasn't, you know, there wasn't bad intentions there about shutting out this model. It's just when these regulations came out 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it just I always assumed students would always be in the same physical space. And so there, there needs to be this sort of regulatory space to create some room uh, for improvement. And then we also think there's lots of opportunity for policy to help accelerate this with charter school authorizers, uh, help better educate. We were talking about some of the challenges of authorizers aren't totally familiar with this model, so how do you help educate them? Uh, funding priorities, we saw this with the U.S. Department of Ed with trying to help you know, accelerate some of this thinking and experimentation with the race to the top district. And we think there's plenty of opportunity with state policymakers to look at this as well in terms of getting uh, you know, bonus points or priority uh, points to, to you know, for their reading grants or their STEM grants for folks that sort of adopt and try to use a blended learning model there too. But we think policy is just critical. It's either going to help accelerate and scale these models or it's going to create just all these inadvertent barriers and further entrench like an, 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 a system that uh, just isn't you know, sort of right for change. Yeah, I'd like to touch on just one or two of those. John did a great job of kind of outlining. Um, so I think uh, we've seen, and in some of we, we've done uh, something called the Next Generation Learning Challenge, where it's sort of a challenge to provide funding to, um, to schools that are looking to adopt blended models. And we've seen the vast majority of, of schools that have applied for that have been charters. Um, and I think it would be great for more district schools uh, to do this. And I think the, the race to the top district funding is going to be a really interesting experiment um, because in a sense that's going to fuel. Now not all of those districts are doing blended learning. Some of them are doing various um, uh, things with technology that John mentioned and technology rich environments and, and things around personalization that aren't necessarily blended learning. But I think it's going to be an impetus, and in some ways, that's going to help us see some of the barriers that we might not perceive right now, um, because the vast majority of students are in traditional district schools, and so if, if we want to think about these opportunities expanding, that's going to be really important. Um, two other quick things. Um, one is, uh, I mentioned before, we're going to have to get a better sense of how we judge performance, and I think one area which is, is very different um, is that as we think about teacher evaluation and feedback models, um, they're going to have to be able to adapt and we're going to need more research. We're beginning to get better research and we're going to learn more and more about kind of traditional teacher evaluation and feedback to help teachers improve in traditional classroom models. Uh, how does that look in the model in your school or in other schools where it's going to be harder to draw that 1 to 20 or 1 to 25 connection, and so that's an area where we're going to need more research and probably more creative thinking around policy. Right now you can kind of, again, you can maybe handle that through exceptions or through charters who have different models, but, but we can anticipate kind of running up against that. Final thing I'd say that is actually, there's a little bit of policy, but it's just capacity for the field in general. Um, it gets to the, the software providers, to uh, the teacher prep and training, to instructional leaders to, to how do you actually do this stuff and, and to John's point with real fidelity and with real attention to the instructional and learning design which I think you're hearing throughout this that's that's really the key we talked a little bit about technology which enables these things and um, I think that's a little bit of the concern particularly as we look at with the race to the top district program wow how, what's the right speed for these things and how do we make sure that the capacity to implement well follows along with it I think that's a that's a real concern and that's a field concern so policymakers should be concerned about that but advocacy organizations and other supporters I think that's a big concern how do we have that capacity to support the schools and educators and districts that are doing this work I, I think one main hindrance that I see in just in talking with those legislators because our, our enrollment is limited at our Virginia Virtual Academy um, based on districts that choose to partner with us. So the model is so vastly different in DC where we operate under a charter 
and in Virginia where we have to actually seek out those districts who are willing to partner with us and willing to take on our students as part of their reporting on progress. Um, so I think our, our challenge is often fear of the unknown. I mean, it's there is a, a, a big bias against <laughs> virtual learning for the most part, and especially when it's backed by a for-profit company. It's like, no, oh, no, no, no. Um, but coming from the public school setting and from the brick and mortar, um, I, I am still a public school teacher. I'm not employed by the state any longer, but I'm a public school teacher. The work I do, the efforts I have are the exact same as they were. Um, the end result is student achievement and student achievement to the level beyond expectation. Uh, so I, I think once once people meet people in the in the uh, in the actual setting who are doing the work, who are actually there the, on the front lines, um, I think they are pretty easily convinced that this could be a good option for some students, and, and that's really all that it needs to be is, is a good option for those students whose needs it meet. It, it meets in my particular case that would make you think it could meet so many more. Um, but I think what we have on our side to kind of combat that fear is we have that transparency of data. I, I can take any legislator and say, you know, here, here's my student data. Um, I have immediate feedback. So-and-so completed a unit assessment five minutes ago. I have their data to support what's working. I have the time stamp on when they finish that. And I can go back and reset it if I do some in-person remediation. I find that they really haven't maintained that information or retained it. So. Um, you know, when you can convince them that the time that the teacher is spending is spent on that further education, whether it be extending that learning or whether it be remediating it as opposed to figuring out what is missing in the student's achievement, um, I think they see that it's worth the investment. So it's really convincing um, individuals at a legislative level that what we do is, is teaching and it is education and it is a need that is very, very much sitting here waiting to be met. So. I think, I think we have some good, good information on our side and, and it's, it's helpful that we have people at the policy level working on it too, but also important for them to speak to those teachers and really be convinced that it, it can work. Just real quick, just build off one. This is sort of like policy light in a way, but that, that last issue of helping to convince, or not convince, but help legislators understand what these models are and aren't is so, so critical. It's a, it's a difficult thing. I mean, it's, it's hard for us just to talk about what these models are like without sort of experiencing it, but if you look at sort of the average legislator and the generation they come from, I mean, it's, as soon as you talk about this and then when they come back, they always go back to the same thing of like, my grandson, you know, picked up an iPad and you can start clicking on the icons, and you're like, yeah, it's just not this. You know, but, but, and, and that's the challenge, right? Because they're coming at it from, they have no other sort of framework to relate back to. And so, you know, unless we sort of take them on field trips, unless you invite them into the school so they can see the model, I find like 10 minutes experiencing a school like one of the two that we're talking about today is worth more than 30 PowerPoints and you know, testimonies and things like that. But we have to sort of get them in and experience it so they can see it and then see what it, what it really is and what it's not. Because I think a lot of times the immediate image that comes up, not just in their minds, but the public minds, is that it's kids blindly sitting in front of a computer for eight hours a day and, you know, and all the bad things that sort of are associated with that. And it's not. I mean, these environments are, are just teeming with life and excitement and, uh, unless you sort of capture that and help them understand that. You know, again, it sets it sets a road, if you will, for some policy barriers. But it's policy light, but it's so critical it kind of help build that political will. With that, I would put in a plug for the sector video. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have about fifteen minutes for questions. And I'm uh, I'm uh, John Workman with the Association of American Geographers, and uh, I apologize, I'm not a real expert on blended learning, but one thing our association does is we work with students to try to bring geospatial technologies to them uh, because of the growth of GIS and GPS in society. 
Um, you know, for example, we'll work with the inner city students in Boston to bring local community planning to them. Or, you know, we'll work with students even in Uganda to show them how they can build systems for irrigation for local subsistence farming. Um, so I guess my question is, what are you finding in terms of blended learning? Are there certain subjects or disciplines which are taught better with these technology-rich environments? Um, and does subject learning become more sort of blended and integrated through technology? I will say that it's probably obvious that the math, which is you know linear, that's a little bit easier because you know in what order to teach and you generally can start a student where they're at a point of review, maybe, and allow them to work back through that, or a student who maybe is not where you'd hope that they are, we would like them to be when they start out and, and take them back a level. Um, humanities are a little bit more tough. Writing is especially a challenge, I would say, in my experience. Um, so it's really uh, trying to find a good mix of technology, but also that human touch, and that's why you know that threat to the teachers really shouldn't be too much of a threat because we've yet to figure out a really good way to grade a paper <laughs> um, or to give specific feedback about voice and, and fluency and all of that. So uh, definitely I would say the humanities are more of a challenge, um, but things such as what you're mentioning, GIS, I mean, that's, that's such a draw for students, and so if we can get them to uh, be more motivated by the technology, they tend to be more engaged with the humanities, whereas, you know, I have parents saying, well, before he wouldn't write even a sentence, but now he'll write a paragraph because it's about anything he wants it to be, or it's about his video game that he's creating, or it's about something related to, to, to the technology, and we just have to face the reality that that is the world the children live in, and if we try to fight that any longer, we're gonna be on the losing end of it. So it's, it's good to hear that that is an effort and that's something that's being focused on, but it is, um, it's not always cut and dry. I mean, that there has to be some human element to it, in my opinion. I'm Sean Kennedy with the Lexington Institute, and I'm, thank you all for coming. This has all been amazing and interesting to hear where everyone is on this space, and I, I hope there's obviously uh, some people who are more and less you know, new to the subject, so I hope I'm not being too, too detailed here. But one of the things we're dealing with here, and it's amazing, special education is great. They just opened the Rhode Island Model School, almost exclusively focused in blended format in special ed. Um, obviously, uh, Mickey, you're dealing with a mixed population of dropout types, and things like that, and we see a lot of ELL, English language learners in the, some of the Bay Area blended schools like Rocket Ship. Um, we have these specialized populations. How is it that we reward schools? Because one of the things we're looking at, we talked about policy vaguely, about seat times, things like that, is budgeting. And so Oakland Unified, for example, has moved to school-based budgeting. Chicago Public Schools are gonna move to school-based budgeting um, next year. Uh, but we're not rewarding schools or teachers with resources when you're bringing kids up grade levels. It's just simply X amount of time, X amount of dollars, that's your allocation. So when K-12 does a great job, they're not being rewarded more. And when Alliance is doing a great job with, with dropout kids, you're not getting any more than the amount of time that they're being allocated. So how do we look to reform budgeting along the lines of blended if we're doing enrichment and remediation simultaneously? Yeah, so this really touches on the competency-based learning piece. And uh, so, right, the two things that always inhibit or, or um, accelerate uh, any work are how we judge performance and how the funding flows. I mean, those are just two critical pieces. And so I think where you're getting is if we're moving, if, if we're looking at more competency-based models, um, how do we think about more uh, flexible funding formulas that can, can look at the progression of students and can help with, I think in particular, the time-based. I mean, we're just about to see this in post-secondary with the recent department's ruling around allowing some competency-based programs to be eligible for financial aid. There is a tremendous amount to figure out here because we absolutely have to ensure high quality and we have to ensure that these things aren't um, a sham. So, I mean, part of what you're thinking about in the post-secondary landscape is that well, if, if I can go faster, why shouldn't I? Um, it sounds like some of your students, and, and I'll note, like you talked about the Casey, which is the X exam, which is here. The A through G curriculum is above and beyond. So that's, you know, your school is not just aiming at the lowest, lowest point. 
But I think this is a, just a, 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 I think we've talked about sort of seat waivers and allowing folks to do competency-based, but the real issue is how do we make sure that the funding flows in a way that ensures high quality, but also does really incent um, and, and reward schools that take on special populations, that really help students move faster and progress or catch up or speed ahead. We're, we're not nearly that nimble, and that's where we're gonna need to get over the next you know, three, four, five years. Hi, uh, Richard Whitmire, I'm working on a book about rocket ship charter schools. And I've been in some uh, school districts where blended learning is being practiced and obviously not very well, um, <laughs> using non-adaptive software, that kind of thing. And it strikes me that this has a huge potential to backfire uh, when schools don't get results. So I'm curious what your scenario is for the backfire. Um, how does that happen and how do you prevent that? I think with any school, I mean, you have to respond to, to what you end up with. So, um, you know, we saw that our students were not doing quite as well on math, and we, we were surprised by that because, as I said, it's harder to teach that, that English component and all of that. So we adapted. I mean, I, and again, I'm, I'm speaking from a, you know, a privatized you know, <laughs> perspective, so that should be acknowledged, but um, the company developed a, a math remediation program, and it's been wildly successful. They also come... Uh, couple the technological piece with a live, what they call the National Math Lab teaching component where these students are attending, in the, they can pick any time of day, so it could be an evening review, it could be you know an early morning review, that they're also attending synchronous sessions online nationally. So the issue is still, you still have to respond to your student population no matter what model you're using. So of course it is a challenge, it does backfire at times, and in my particular model, it, again, it's not gonna work if you don't have all of the pieces there. So there are times where we do counsel families to return to a more traditional setting or seek a different setting, but um, but usually we are the ones who have to fix it. We have to adapt to it just like you would in your in your brick and mortars. And I'm hoping with the blended model that someday I'll write a book. I'm not I'm better than my last test score. And it really it really comes to mind um, Jackie, one of my students, incredibly violent middle schooler came to me um, on probation. And she was in my office and she's walking by, she's special ed, said, Jackie, how'd you do on your benchmarks? So every 10 weeks, we, we benchmark so that we can see mastery of standards. And I said, are you green? Are you proficient yet? She said, Dr. Tubbs, you always tell us I'm more than my last benchmark score. And you know I came to you far below basic. You should be happy on basic. That's three, three steps up. And sometimes you have to be reminded because I do feel that pressure because I'm the only model out of 21 schools in my organization. So is it, is it working? Is it working? You just have to come and feel it's working. The data will catch up to us. I really believe that. And I really believe that this model, because of the competency, the personalization, we're going to move away from test scores because that should not be how Jackie should be measured. Just so, just I think it's a great question because so I lived through you know in the '90s there was a huge sort of um, you know we've gone through booms and busts in terms of technology promising something people get disappointed by it and then there's like a bust that comes out of it and and there's a, we're in the midst of a huge boom right now boom with uh, philanthropy dollars flowing into it government dollars private sector dollars lots of excitement lots of uh, and. and there's, one of the concerns I have is, is this any different from the other sort of booms that we've had in the past? And what happens if, they, again, people start experiencing disappointment? I think there are three things that are different this time around. First, the, the, the development with the software and the services is just completely different today than it was at any other point. You used to always be locked in. Remember how we always had to buy a software? It was like version one and version two. And now, especially with the web-based things, these things are, they don't even release versions. It's always constantly being updated. There was one Google product that went through, through 800 different updates in a year. Uh, it wasn't like version 800. It was just like kind of part of the continuous involvement of the, the fine-tuning of these services. And particularly as like, I think folks start working with schools to kind of fine-tune these over time. The software gets better, the models get better. Second, I think we have better data. Like back in the previous times, the, the idea of giving teachers data was, 
they got a bunch of numbers back, usually. Maybe if they were lucky, an Excel spreadsheet or something, but, but the data wasn't really meaningful. It wasn't information. And I think uh, now what you're seeing is a whole lot more analytics and sort of answering the question of like, so what? What do I as a teacher do with this? And you're seeing systems uh, in a whole variety of ways making recommendations, whether it's grouping with kids, what the kids should do next. The teachers often can override that, but there's at least a, a so what question that the systems are trying to get better at answering to make the data more sort of information. And again, that informs uh, the model. And, and then the third, I, I think, is that, that sort of the, what we were just talking about here, that we are getting access to better data almost on a daily basis with these models beyond just sort of the test scores. Uh, and, and when you think about it, accountability systems generally are sort of, they're, they're by their very nature almost dumbed down because they always have to go for the lowest common denominator. Uh, the reason we didn't have growth models with No Child Behind in 2001 is because only two or three states could report growth models. Now most states can because they have the data systems. I think the sort of next generation of accountability are the models like you're hearing here with blended learning and rocket ship and other folks because they just have reams of data that we haven't even started thinking about how can that help inform us about student engagement uh, the velocity of learning you know, productivity whatever you want to call it but that's a little bit of what we're looking at with the growth models here proficiency or mastery there's a whole litany of other things here that potentially can give us like more meaningful and more authentic account accountability than what we have through again that sort of just lowest common denominator that we have right now so I think that's what's fundamentally different about this, and I think, again, it all sort of informs this, you know, continuous improvement cycles that these models, it's part of the reason it's so difficult to evaluate the models, because the models are changing and improving on such a rapid basis that, you know, the software system that was starting to be used at the beginning of the year is not the same one that's, you know, evolved over the year uh, to the end point there. So, I think that I, I'm particularly hopeful, I think, that this time around there's not going to be as much disappointment. I do worry, though, about the, the, what my biggest fear is it's um, folks calling themselves blended learning models that actually aren't blended learning. This gets back to that fidelity. Like, unless, uh, Michael Horn and I were talking about this yesterday over email, like, how do you, how do you tell the difference between, you know, the examples we just heard today in a school that just gives laptops and the kids access an online resource? You know, there is something fundamentally there, but how, how do you distinguish that so that we separate the really good practices from, the not so good practices, the not signature practices. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Francis Everly. I'm with the National Association of State School Boards or State Boards of Education. Um, and thank you very much for the presentation. It really was enlightening in many ways. Um, one of the things that we deal with is trying to inform, educate state boards of education. And they deal with a lot of these issues, and people come to them with certain criteria, it seems like, and I'm going to simplify that, what you're talking about is really making sure they're educated so they can make decisions because really they have lack of information. And we do throw terms at them frequently. And I know the Virginia example uh, with the virtual high schools and their issue of trying to decide, you know, is this a threat or what's doing? And you've got blended learning, you know, you've got the new tech, you have new tech high schools, sort of what their promise is, and then you have project-based learning. And so my sort of takeaway for this group um, that we deal with is really an educational issue because I think there are models out there which is terrific and that's why I thank you. But my question is really more to what I think you were just beginning to get to, uh, both John and, and Michelle, which is our, is the blended learning more than competency based? Is it moving students to much, in the current term, is deeper learning, but are they dealing with problem solving, critical skills? being able to communicate in new ways? And is the technology, do you know, and this is what you I think just were referring to, John, is it capable of capturing that kind of information versus a simple you know, assessment that sort of quantifies it instead of numbers? You know, how, do you, how do you deal with that in your school? Because yeah. uh, you, you've, the, the, I mean, you've got the collaborative, which is interesting. You know, it sounded like there's some projects based on that. But Clearly, you're shooting higher than just the... Absolutely. Um, our core value is college ready and beyond. So everything that we do, even within the blended model, speaks to that. So when you come to our school, you'll, you'll see that our students are very confident. They can speak about their learning. They can speak about their mastery. And they certainly can speak about where and what they need to do to get to the college of their choice. We do a lot of project-based learning in the collaborative. 
That's the hardest thing to teach a teacher, though, is what does that look like? What does an exemplar look like? So we're archiving those right now. We really want to make sure that the students are learning and loving learning. I, it always strikes me when you're with a group of people and they're always talking about their high school experience. Well, you haven't learned anything since high school? That's pretty sad. And I don't want any of my students coming through Tenenbaum Tech to only talk about Tenenbaum Tech. I want them to talk every single day about what they're learning and how they're growing and developing and becoming a global citizen. I had one of my students ask me yesterday, and this goes back to policy because I said I have to check. He has a full class load, seat time. He wants to teach himself physics and sit for the AP exam. Can you figure out how to do that? I said, okay, I'll get back to you. So that's, those are the kind of students that, that are coming through Ten Long Tech. You know, I think there's um, there, there's a lot, there's a new challenge that we haven't be, totally encountered yet, but I think this is going to sort of feel the competency base. It's right now if you talk to a lot of districts, they're all struggling a little bit with uh, with this sort of bring your own technology. What happens when school students show up with you know a smartphone prices you know decline and is get lower and as tablets kids are showing up with technology. I wonder what happens when kids start showing up with their own learning. You know that when you when you think about just think about over the last year all the different MOOC courses that have been launched this new coder uh, program and code academy you know what happens when students start taking these things out without their schools knowing and then they show up at their their school and say oh my gosh like I taught myself coding or I taught I took Michael Sandel's like theories of justice course at Harvard like what does the school do with that right and, and, and again it may only initially be a niche group of students but I'm not convinced it's always going to be the gifted kids. I think it's what you're hearing here, that there's a lot of kids that feel motivations for all sorts of reasons that are gonna to wanna to learn coding, or gonna to wanna to learn something. And then how do we make sure that they're sort of recognized, uh, celebrated, and also given credit? Not saying, you know, it's nice that you just went through Code Academy, but we're gonna to have to make you take a computer science course, right? And it's just sort of, it's counterproductive in a way, and I think it's gonna sort of drive this competency of saying like, it's great you took Code Academy, let's, let's see if you really know how to code, and then we'll give you credit for it, and then you'll be able to take another course, rather than have to, you know, take a whole another year course there. So that, I, I think there's huge, uh, huge opportunities there as well, because again, we can start sort of engaging kids where they are and with their interests uh, around a whole litany of different education opportunities out there. Good time for one more. Here in the back. Chris Bronlett with the uh, Thomas Jefferson Institute and also a member of the uh, Virginia Board of Education. Um, a lot of good information here, a lot of good information in the, in the paper that was done. One of my takeaways from the paper was that in preparing students for, for college, you actually brought in a dual enrollment course, set them down in the classic freshman lecture instructional model, which is very different from what they're clearly doing in your school. Um, one of the challenges with academically at-risk kids is that not so much getting them into college, but getting them to graduate college. Or do you, or does anyone else have any plans to, to track your graduating classes and get a sense of their success both in the post-secondary world and frankly in, in uh, either whether college or, or work? Um, we have an online presence, a software called Naviance, and the students start um, inputting their data and tracking their, their college interest using this software. And then once they get to college, we do have a department within the Alliance that also tracks students. We had one of our first students who graduated as a math teacher. She's now back with us teaching math in one of our middle schools. So we, we've gotten much better. The first three graduating classes, we weren't able to track as readily, but that's why we added the, the online presence. So I'll just make a pitch to you as a State Board of Education member. Um, it's, I, I agree, uh, if we're really saying students are prepared to succeed after they leave high school, uh, figuring out how they did and getting that feedback back to educators so that they can improve their programs is really important. And it's not fair to make each school have to do that on their own. So this is where, where the state has a responsibility and uh, where states can, can step up and help schools do that work. Thank you for your great questions. It's been a terrific uh, panel. I'm sure you all agree, and uh, a lot of lots to chew on. And uh, I will uh, turn it over to John Chow for Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to begin by asking all of you to join me. In. <laughs> What, what occurred to 
me as I was listening to this uh, as I was listening to this session is um, is uh, that we just we just spent the morning talking about uh, blended learning in which there was an almost complete focus on what matters most, uh, which is the teaching and the learning. And there's a lot of controversy that swirls around the use of technology and whether it's a threat to the public school system and schools as we know it, and you have a business involvement and. Uh, and the, the, so the politics of this uh, is, is kind of messy. And actually this morning we didn't really talk about that uh, because the, the reason that there is interest in blended learning and which what came out so clearly listening to the panelists today is that, uh, is that educators want our kids to be able to be more successful than they are today. Uh, we want our children who struggle to be more successful. We want our English language learners to be more successful, we want our high flyers, and we want our, uh, our average bear of students to be, to be more successful. And the traditional classrooms uh, have only gotten us so far. So it's just, uh, it's so inspiring to me to see, uh, to, to, to see educators, to see uh, policy makers, to, be, to see the, the foundation world uh, so passionate about this. Um, I think we can all agree uh, that we need, we need answers, we need uh, new uh, directions for our schools, and it's, uh, it's an absolute inspiration to see folks like this uh, who are now uh, focused on this uh, every day. So again, thank you, Susan, uh, for, the, for the great piece of, uh, piece of research and journalism, and again, thank you to the panelists, and finally, thank you uh, to all of you for giving us uh, your morning. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.